We're jumping into the last chapter of Acts chapter 2, uh, the last paragraph, rather, of Acts chapter 2 today. If you want to open there with me, I'd love for you to, to have your Bible open as we go through this. And this passage that we're going to look at contains a list of activities and a description of the earliest church's worship that we're going to examine together in detail as we discover together in God's Word what our worship together as a church should look like. Uh, let's quickly talk about how we get there in the book of Acts, how we get to this last paragraph that starts in verse 42. And I don't think my clicker is working this morning. If I could get a, let's go to the first slide there in my message, if you would. There you go. Um, if you have one that works, somebody could run it down. That'd be great. Uh, so in Acts, uh, when the book starts, Jesus has died on the cross in Jerusalem and risen from the dead. Uh, he has appeared to his disciples, not, not just the 12 disciples, uh, but, but to many of his followers since his resurrection. His last appearance to them is recorded in Acts chapter 1, when he tells his disciples that they will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on them, and then they will be his witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria to the ends of the earth. After he said this, Jesus was taken up before their eyes, and a cloud hid, them, hid him from their sight. Now, at this time, the believers numbered about 120. That's the number we find in Acts 1, 15. And at the moment, uh, the moment that Jesus had promised, where the Holy Spirit would come on them in power, arrives 50 days after his crucifixion on the day of Pentecost, as recorded in Acts 2. It's, there, the Holy Spirit descends on the disciples in tongues of fire, they begin to speak miraculously in such a way that everyone understands them in their native tongue. And then Peter addresses the crowd. So that's what most of Acts chapter 2 is, is, is this sermon from Peter. He points out that what the crowd there is witnessing in Jerusalem is the pouring out of God's spirit that God had promised through the prophet Joel. He points out there that the Old Testament scriptures had pointed to Jesus all along as the one who would be the Savior. And in fact, he tells them, that God has made this Jesus, whom they crucified, both Lord and Messiah. Cody, you can go to the next slide there for me. In verse 37, it says, When the people heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the other apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? Peter replied, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you and your children and all who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. So here in this moment, he shows the people there the door that they were challenged to go through. When they ask, well, what do we need to do about this? What do we need to do about the fact that our, of, of our guilt, the fact that we have crucified the Messiah? He said, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the, and for the forgiveness of your sins, and then you'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And then he makes clear in verse 39 that this promise that he told them uh, is not just for them, not just for the crowd in Jerusalem, but for all whom the Lord our God will call. So that includes you and I here in 2024. Right? That's the door we've been given to walk through to repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of our sins. That day, in Acts chapter 2, we read that 3,000 people went through that door. We read in verse 41 that those who accepted his message were baptized, and about 3,000 were added to their number that day. Those people, together with 120 from Acts 15, become the they of Acts 2, verse 42. So in the passage we're reading, it starts with the word they, and that's who we're talking about. This group of people, the 120 uh, disciples who had followed Jesus and were waiting for the appearing of the Holy Spirit, in, in Acts 1.15, and this group of people who have walked through the door and accepted the challenge that Peter gave them to repent and be baptized. So let's read this paragraph now in, in, in its entirety, starting in verse 42. It says there, They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. 
That sounds like a fun group, doesn't it? I think of, I was thinking of that this morning. We have had so much fun this morning. We have had a prayer request answered before it was prayed for. We have had someone with a very pure spirit express awe and wonder at the reading of Philippians 2 by these two young gentlemen up here at just the perfect time. And uh, so we get to share in this time of fellowship together. And when I read this passage, you can just feel the joy coming off of, of what was happening here in Jerusalem for the earliest believers and the way they were interacting with each other. We're going to be going through this list uh, one item at a time, and in a manner that I will admit is less than ideal, we're going to do it out of order. And that is because if we do so, we can align the items we find in this list with opportunities and practice that we have as a church body to live and act out these activities together. For instance, uh, we're going to talk about prayer the Sunday before we observe the International Day of Prayer for the Persecuted Church later um, next month. And today, because we're having a block party tonight at 6 o'clock here across the street from the church, we're skipping to an item from this list that we find in verse 42. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship. Fellowship meant that they were devoted to partnership, to contributory help, to participation, to sharing in communion a fellowship in the spirit. This word in Greek is koinonia, and it's one that's used a couple dozen times across the New Testament, some of which I'll get to share with you this morning. But this word is intensely about what we share in common, okay? What we do together and what we share in common. And I just want to point out how this word not only appears in the list there, second in the list in Acts 2.42, but also how it fills the text of this paragraph. Look at how this paragraph is kind of defined and highlighted by fellowship. All the believers were together and had everything in common. That's literally what fellowship means. They gave to anyone who had need. Every day they continued to meet together. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts. This is a people who were intensely connected to each other. This was a people who took one of the most expensive commodities that we have in our lives, the ones that you and I value maybe more than anything else, our time, and they were giving it to each other and receiving it from each other. This is the model that God's word gives us, and this is the challenge I want to pass on to you today. How intense, how generous, how important is your fellowship with other believers to you? Does your commitment to your brothers and sisters in the faith, the other people here together with you in this room, not just the ones you like, but all of them, does your commitment to them look like this paragraph? These believers in the earliest church understood something very important. So here's one way you could say it. You could say that they shared the most important thing about themselves in common. But I think there's an even better way to say it. These believers have in common the only thing that really matters. These believers have in common the only thing that really matters, and that is Jesus. That's what defines their fellowship. That's what brings them together. As we are told in Romans 6, their baptism, which we just read about them doing in the, very, in the previous verse, in, in verse 41, their baptism was into Christ Jesus. So now it does not matter that they are from one place or from another, that they have different jobs, that they disagree on this or that. They have Jesus. And that is the only thing that really matters. It's, it's bigger than, than being the most important thing. It's in a category all by itself. If you have Jesus, then that is something that you have in common with other people in this room that transcends any other identity or marker or association. Because this is true, they give themselves to one another without hesitation, with sincerity and with generosity. So why wouldn't we? Listen, I know that we have our differences in this room. I know that we don't see eye to eye about everything. I know some of you drive green tractors. Some of you drive red ones. 
Some of us in this room root for a football team that has won national championships. Some of us do not. Some of us eat pork, and some of us don't. Some of us prefer the organ, and some of us would prefer a couple electric guitars. We don't all live in the same town. We don't all go to the same schools. We won't all vote the same in November. We won't always see everything the same way. But we have something in common. You have something in common with every other believer in this room that is bigger and better than anything else that you have. We have the only thing in common that really matters. We have been saved by the grace of God through the work of Jesus Christ, his son. And if that is true of you, and it's true of another person here, then none of those other things really matter. We belong to each other through Jesus Christ, our Lord. That's what puts us together. That's what make, puts us in this position where we owe our fellowship to each other, is this identity. Because this is true, we need to offer ourselves to each other in fellowship, the kind that we see in Acts 2. I want to point you to a passage in 1 John 1. You can turn there if you'd like. It's also printed on the inside of your bulletin this morning. Here in this passage, we have the highest concentration in the New Testament of this word, koinonia, or fellowship, that we have read in Acts 2, verse 42. And, and it makes this point quite well. It defines for us why we have this fellowship that I'm challenging you with this morning. So in 1 John chapter 1, starting in verse 1, this is what we read. That which is from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked at and our hands have touched, this we proclaim concerning the word of life. The life appeared, we have seen it and testified to it, and we proclaim to you the eternal life, which was the Father and has appeared to us. We proclaim to you what we have seen and heard, so that you also may have fellowship with us. And our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. We write these things to make our joy complete. It's important to understand that our fellowship is one that extends not simply between us here in this room to each other, right? Our fellowship is based on the fact that we have fellowship with Jesus, and that is what we share in common. It's not just a duty to your brother or sister in Christ fellowship, but is a participation in Jesus to share fellowship with your brother and sister in Christ. This sounds what, um, uh, what, what uh, John has written in this passage sounds very much like the prayer he records of Jesus in John chapter 17. God the Father and God the Son share a unity that we are invited to share in. We are invited to have the same kind of fellowship and relationship to each other as that which Christ shares with God. Picking back up in 1 John 1, now in verse 5. This is the message we have heard from him and declare to you. God is light. In him there is no darkness at all. If we claim to have fellowship with him and yet walk in the darkness, we lie and do not live out the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from all sin. Those who walk in the light share the most important thing, the only thing that really matters about themselves in common. And that brings us into fellowship with each other. As we saw in Acts 2, this fellowship is not just something to be felt. And it's not just something you can say with your mouth. That's not going to cut it. Don't tell me that you are in fellowship with believers. I may not believe you. Live out your fellowship. The way that the early church did. The way that we see them doing this in Acts 2. Meet together with believers on occasions like the one we have right now, this morning, in worship. That is an exercise in fellowship. Give to those brothers and sisters in Christ who have need as you are able. That's what fellowship looks like. In fact, giving or, or supporting someone who is in need 
later in the New Testament, in places like 1 Corinthians, or rather 2 Corinthians 9 and elsewhere, he, instead of giving or offering being the word used there, he uses the word fellowship when he asks people to raise money to support those who are in need. He uses this word, fellowship. And finally, we need to intentionally do life together. Fellowship can't be just something that we do an hour on Sunday mornings. That's not what that word means. That's not what we see the church doing in Acts chapter 2. You can't read that paragraph and tell me these are people who saw each other for an hour a week. The fellowship of the church is about life lived together with these people with whom you have an incredible bond, the bond of Jesus Christ, the bond of God's gracious salvation given to us. And that, that has to take up more time than an hour in the week. We need to give to each other and receive from each other more fellowship than that. We need to be looking for opportunities in our life to encourage and lift up and support and give to the fellow believers that we have. The other people who are called by the name of Jesus Christ in our lives. Our fellowship isn't, a lim isn't limited to events. Not limited to the things that go on the calendar. We need to seek opportunities for companionship and time together with them for this purpose outside of anything we put on the calendar. But sometimes we do get to put fellowship on the calendar. And this is something that we do together at Madison Church pretty regularly, right? We sometimes will have a meal downstairs and what do we call it? A fellowship dinner, right? We have things like this. We have events at our church where we get together and do absolutely nothing productive. Right? And sometimes, as a preacher, as somebody uh, who, uh, who feels a burden to fulfill the Great Commission, like I wonder, like, is that what we should be doing? But then I read about how the church loved each other in Acts 2.42, and I know that it is. I know that sharing our lives together on purpose is part of what God has in mind for us in following Jesus. That's what we have an opportunity to do tonight. Uh, and so I guess this is announcement time, but there is a block party tonight at 6 o'clock across the street, and we're not going to do anything productive there. I, we, aren't, we aren't going to sing any songs, and there will not be a Bible lesson, but here's what you have a chance to do. You will have the chance to spend your time to take that commodity that you have and that we value so much and give it to your brothers and sisters in Christ. To spend your time with them in fellowship, together in community, in conversation. To learn about their lives. To connect with them personally so that you can share their burdens. So that you know how to pray for them. So that you know what kind of help they need that you can offer. You have a chance to get together at events like this, the, the times when fellowship can be put on the calendar, to belong together as the body of Christ. We don't get together and do things like this because it's fun, even though it is, and I dare you to go there and try to not have any fun. And we don't even get together at events like the one we're having tonight because it's good for the health of our church, even though it is, it's really good for the health of our church. We gather for fellowship because it is an act of worship to the Savior that we share in common. And if you want to offer your worship, the kind of worship that the church was offering from the very moment it began in Acts chapter 2, then you can do that by fellowshipping together with your brothers and sisters in Christ, by simply taking your time and giving it to them in the name of Jesus Christ our Lord. We do this because it was what the church was meant to do, and as we've seen today, is what the church was doing from the very beginning. Will you guys pray with me? Dear Holy Father, I thank you for the fellowship of these people. God, I thank you for the just incredible ways they've encouraged me in my faith and in my walk. God, I thank you for the fellowship that my family has felt from them and just the incredible gift that is to us. God, I, I pray for anyone here today who has not felt 
the loving embrace of our church family. God, I ask them to, to seek and to share fellowship with your people so that they can be a part of that worship which, is, which we read about here in Acts chapter 2 which has been happening since the very day your Holy Spirit arrived in power. God, we know what brings us together. It's not anything outside of this place, but it is only the name of your son, Jesus. God, and so it is in his name that we belong to one another, and it is his, in his name that we will offer our time together here in this room and even tonight when we're playing silly games. God, we pray these things in your name. Amen.